with our subjects is true Christian behaviour. And the Apostle Paul, as you know, in Romans 12, turns to very practical exhortations. It turns from the chapters of doctrine and depths to personal application and here in the 12th chapter, the life of righteousness. And this is about the outgoing and the unselfish ways of believers. It's about magnanimity, about sympathy, about harmony. And so, hopefully, we'll, uh, time permitting, we'll reach the end of the chapter, but I want to study, really, these verses in a simple, direct, expository way, because here is uh, the clear standard for Christian people in their lives. And not only the standards spelled out here, but this serves also as a test, if you like, of our level of sanctification. These are very searching exhortations. So we begin with those in verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Distributing, a very interesting word. Literally, the Greek is the word for sharing. You might translate it sharing in the needs of saints. In other parts of uh, uh, Paul's epistles, it's differently translated. In 2 Corinthians, in the very last verse, we read of the communion of the Holy Spirit. And that word communion, the Greek, is exactly the same as the word here translated distributing. So having, if you like, communion in relieving the needs of the saints. Sharing, partnership would be a good translation of the term. So there it is in verse 13, having partnership in the needs of the saints. Saints being those set apart a way of describing God's people, the Lord's people. So communion is a helpful term, fellowship, partnership. If somebody has need, could be need of accommodation, the Apostle Paul frequently had need of accommodation, uh, maybe great need financially or some other need, maybe a need not material at all, of comfort or companionship. We give it not in a condescending way, not as one who has, giving to one who has not, but we give it within the family. That's the idea of the Greek word translated here, distributing, sharing. This is my brother, my sister. We're children of the same parent. This is within the family. You don't think of, well, I have, and I am prospered, and I am richer, or more established, and you are further back or lower down somehow, and I condescend to help you. That's a completely unchristian spirit. We have needs among ourselves. It's a sharing of the bounty that God has given and a helping of each other in a humble spirit. What we have is not our own. And so if there is a great need, we help and we share. So in a way, though the translation can't be criticised, distributing to the needs and the necessity of saints misses a little the point of the original. If, if it had been more religious and said, having communion in the relief of others, that would have made us think. Having partnership, having share, sharing as a role. But that's the sense of the original. Distributing to the necessity of saints, having communion with people in this, and then given to hospitality. The word translated given actually literally is pursuing, pursuing hospitality. And to go back to the original there is quite helpful to us because it clothes given to hospitality, it strengthens it, it it's, puts into it a keenness an eagerness, a readiness. I suppose it's there in given to hospitality, if you sufficiently emphasize the given to. But we are those who eagerly extend hospitality. 
And the word translated hospitality is quite complex too. It has to do with fondness for foreigners or fondness for strangers. So there is affection and concern and feeling in this kind of hospitality given to, pursuing, eager to extend as if it's a duty on our part. Hospitality, kindness to others in need. So distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality, says the Apostle Paul to Titus, a lover of hospitality. That's what a Christian ought to be. Of course, uh, it is here in this context, particularly among, in the church, among Christian people, distributing to the necessity of saints, those who are the Lord's and set apart for him. And yet elsewhere, let us do good as we have opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are of the household of faith, but unto all. So while it's primarily and first and foremost that we relieve each other within the spiritual family, at the same time, we have to be compassionate as opportunity arises and careful toward all people. That's the Christian standard. That's the way. I ought to just say a word about priorities in this because there are those who claim to be Bible believers and evangelical, but there are those today who are putting too much emphasis on the responsibility of God's people of the church to pursue social welfare programs and things of that kind. And they twist, it is, it is a twist, and misinterpret scriptures in order to arrive at this. Our first responsibility is spiritual. It is the gospel. Our second responsibility is to relieve and help among the family of God, believers. And if you could prioritize this, only then our third responsibility, and it is natural for a born-again person to desire this, is to help all other people as opportunity or great need arises. But it is quite wrong to say that it is our first responsibility to lead the way in social reform and social welfare. Now, the believers and the churches of Christ have in history often led the way as God has given opportunity and set up various compassionate ministries and still do, particularly on the mission field and so on. But it's not our first responsibility and nobody should attempt to make it that. Our first responsibility is to do the greatest social work of all and that is the proclamation of the gospel. When lives are changed, when people come under the sway of the moral principles of the Bible, that's the finest social work. That achieves more than anything. And of course the greatest priority is the spiritual salvation of lost souls anyway. So we emphasize that. Constantly one hears uh, the words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And there are people who interpret that as meaning uh, compassionate work, which is a good thing. But they make the Lord's words good works apply to that. And some go even further and they say, you can't preach the gospel until and unless you do compassionate work first as though there's no Holy Spirit, as though there's no power in the Word of God, as though unless you do something to commend yourself to people, you cannot expect them to listen to you. Well, that's not the teaching of the Scripture. The teaching of the Scripture is to preach the Gospel. And with the preaching of the Gospel, the Holy Spirit works in mighty power, far greater power than any human social kindness can achieve. 
and brings people to Christ and that changes lives and as I've said that is the greatest social work imaginable because it makes people kinder better in their families provide for their own and responsible in every way and the difference it makes times of revival and reformation times of awakening in this country have done far more to lift the standards and the compassionate activities of the land than any direct effort to do those things. And from time to time, though seldom these days, I think it must be something like 25, 30 years ago I last heard this, but from time to time you do even hear exasperated politicians saying what this country needs is another awakening of the kind uh, that happened at the great awakening in the 18th century or the 19th century. Uh, some people have enough sense to realize that that is going to accomplish far more than any direct social work activity could. But we have social workers in our midst in this congregation and nothing that I say takes away an ounce from all your labours and the things that you achieve and the things that you do. That's a very necessary calling and occupation and we support it. We don't wish to undermine it. But to tell the churches of Christ who have the most powerful message which transforms lives, you need to be doing social work first and foremost in order to gain a hearing. That's wrong and it's a misinterpretation of scripture also. Let your light so shine before men, the words of Christ, that they may see your good works, refers to the good works of holy living. That's clear in the context. It refers to the good works of the spread of the gospel and the living righteous lives before God. That's the context in which Christ utters those words. And that is how the apostles interpreted them also. I turn just for a moment. We read it to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Listen to this. This is the apostle Peter almost quoting right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Almost. Having your conversation, your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Did you hear the Sermon on the Mount there? And so it often occurs in the epistles of Peter. But look at the preceding verse. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The context is holy living having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, so that while they speak against you, and they tell stories, trumped up fictitious stories about all sorts of evil things you're supposed to do, they may be overwhelmed by your good works, your holy lives, and uh, that will lead them to think again, and so on. From verses 13, 14, 15, Oh, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. But the context, as in the Sermon on the Mount, is holy living. Those are the good works that Christ primarily refers to. Well, we must go on. And looking at Romans chapter 12 and moving on to verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Bless them which persecute you. Well, this goes right against the every inclination of the fallen human heart. Bless them which persecute you. The fallen heart wants at the very least to resent, if not to wish ill upon those who hurt or persecute but no the standard is bless them which persecute speak well of that's what bless means speak well of or speak well to or speak well about those that persecute you 
The obvious interpretation is pray for them. He very often can't speak well of them. Everything they do is hostile and bad. But you can speak well about them in the sense that you can pray for them. And you must. Bless them which persecute you. Call down from on high, not harm, but blessing. It goes against nature. But that's the standard for the Christian. Bless them which persecute you. And it's so important it's repeated. Bless. Invoke. Call down. Blessing upon them. And curse not. That's the standard. That's what's necessary. Now at this point, looking at a command like this, we often think, yes, but what about... David's imprecatory psalms. What about the psalmist when he prays for great harm to come upon some of his enemies? And now we're told, no, that must never be. It's not part of the Christian character. It's not part of the Christian life. So how do we explain David's imprecations in the psalms? What did he mean? Well, yes, it's true. There are six main psalms of imprecation and another four or five which just incline in that direction. Some people make a few more, but that's roughly the situation. The point is, how are, to, how are they to be explained? David was not wrong. David spoke under inspiration of God. David was a prophet. So it's right that he should utter those things, but how is it that he may do so and we may not? Well, this is the standard of Christian character. And by the way, if we test ourselves with these commands, how do we look? How do we match up? Well, back to David... Yes, David uh, spoke against in his psalms and prayed for hurt and judgment to come upon some pretty extreme and violent and wicked and intransigent, malicious, evildoers. They were very extreme situations. However, the extreme doesn't excuse him. But the fact is that David doesn't speak as a man. David in those psalms speaks as a type of Christ. He speaks as God under inspiration. Those psalms show us the righteous judgment of God in avenging the extreme evil of the people that are mentioned. We cannot utter or desire harm or judgment on anyone and we never must. It is God, for God to do that. And the Psalms where David prays for judgment upon people in, in strong terms are an indication to us of the certain judgment of God that will come in his wisdom, according to his justice. It didn't come upon Paul. Paul was a persecutor. Paul was intransigent. Paul could not be appealed to by anything. And yet God humbled him to the dust and changed him and saved him. Judgment, dear friends, is up to God. In Paul's case, God chose to put the judgment upon Christ. And he suffered and bore away Paul's judgment on Calvary's cross. In other cases... The evildoer will die unrepentant and suffer his own punishment. But judgment is with the Lord. So remember the imprecatory psalms of David are not David's desires being expressed, but the inspired judgment of God upon those people. And David, no doubt, is often comforted by this, that God will dispense mercy or judgment according to his infallible will. But for us, we must never desire or utter vengeance. Bless them which persecute you, 
bless and curse not. Let me come down to verse 17. I'm going back to verse 15 in a moment, but to keep the theme, to keep the point. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, never provoke. And then verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. No vengeance for us, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So let's look at this 19th verse for a moment. Avenge not yourselves. There's a lot of desire for vengeance today in the world. And I suppose it's increased with atheism, with the loss of belief in God. If there is a tragedy, befalls a family, and someone in that family is either murdered or killed by the carelessness of others. The family wants a sort of vengeance. And it's reported on the news as such. And it's put in more delicate terms. Now that justice has been done, the family can feel that justice has been done and get closure. Now actually, the family has been persuaded to seek vengeance in seeing justice done. Now you see, if you're a believer, you say vengeance is the Lord's. Judgment is to come. God will mete out judgment according to his wisdom. He may mete out mercy or judgment. That is with the Lord. You don't feel that you cannot be at peace until something happens to the person. Until you see them shut up in prison. Maybe what they deserve, but you don't feel that. You don't think, I cannot get this word that's now very much in fashion. I cannot get closure until I see justice done. It's really a desire for vengeance. And it's come in because people no longer believe in the Lord. And they no longer believe in a day of judgment. And they no longer believe that that's for God. And that's in his hands. So you have to see some sort of judgment or vengeance for yourself on earth. Don't you see that? And we see it day after day on the news. The new doctrine. Without God, you must have some sense of vengeance or you cannot be at peace and you cannot rest. That's very sad. But for believers, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Now look at these words in verse 19, because it's important to understand them. But rather, give place unto wrath. That means to say, leave room for the wrath of God, for the justice of God. That's what the phrase means. Rather, I used to think at one time, it was just a rather elegant way of saying, push wrath aside and substitute it with something better. Push the desire for vengeance aside and put in its place a desire that for good to come about. But no, it means but rather. Rather is in italic. The translators have inserted the word to help the sense. Don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place or give room for or leave a place for the wrath of God. But it doesn't say of God. No, well, often wrath is stated in that way in the scripture as the wrath. The wrath. And it refers to the wrath of God. And that's how we should read it here. But rather give place unto, make room for, leave it all to the coming wrath, the day of judgment. Let God be the one who gives vengeance or who pays back, but not you. And then there is the quotation, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. This comes from Deuteronomy. 
the fifth book of the Bible, book of Moses, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, verse 20, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What do you understand by that? Do good to your enemies, because by so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. That doesn't sound very nice. As it stands, the immediate sense you get is do good, because somehow or other, that will be hurtful to him. But the sense is this, that the coals of fire won't always happen, but it will often happen, and it may even lead to salvation. The coals of fire will be the anguish and the regret and the pain that the perpetrator feels at what he's done. If you're kind to him, if you don't return like with like, and you maintain your testimony and your Christian character, and you deal patiently and favorably, and you bear things without retaliation, that person will go away and feel really bad. In so doing, by your kindness and your magnanimity and your helpfulness, you are not returning like with like, he will feel bad, and such conscience as he has will be moved, and it may lead to his salvation. It did with Paul. It certainly did with the Apostle Paul. He persecuted believers. Some of them were put to death before his salvation. He was such a bigoted man, so against the believers, and he sought special appointment and special authority to go from town to town, city to city, persecuting Christians, having them committed to those terrible dungeon town jails, and worse happening to them. And when Christ appeared to him and spoke to him, he said, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. What do you think those goads, those barbs put into the side of the working animal or beast, what do you think that meant? Well, I'm sure, but I'm speculating, I own it. I'm sure that among them were pangs of remorse for what he was doing to people who never cursed him who never attempted to retaliate, who never hit back, who never invade against him, those pangs of remorse. Have you ever looked carefully in 2 Corinthians at the Apostle Paul's description of repentance? This is a long passage. Let me read it for you, to you. The Corinthians had sinned grievously, this is not just the Corinthian sinner. He may have been at the heart of it, but the Corinthians had sinned grievously in throwing discipline to one side at one point, but they'd repented. And this was the nature of their repentance. And as I read it, don't you think Paul is echoing here his own repentance and how he felt when God touched his heart and showed him he was a persecutor of believers. Listen to this. Read from verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. And verse 11, for behold this selfsame thing. The rendering is complex, but listen to the language. That ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Ye you longed to be clear of the sin. Yea, what indignation against yourselves. Yea, what fear 
How could I do this? Will I do it again? Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge against yourselves. Why, if you could have purged your deep shame by punishing yourself, you would have done it, but that was no good. You had to come under the blood of Christ. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Well, I believe that Paul is showing us something of the pain he felt in his own repentance and the indignation against himself. So back to Romans 12 and down to verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, be kind to him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That is the most likely way and certainly the way that God may use if he chooses to bring that person to deep shame. That's the coals of fire on his head. He'll suffer for what he's done for you but in a way that may bring him to repentance and salvation and life. So never seek vengeance. Vengeance is mine, I will repay by your kindness. You may be a channel of blessing to that person, that person seeing his evil and foolishness. And verse 21, be not overcome of evil. That means when the persecution comes, or you don't have much physical persecution in this land, but we have it in other forms, and somebody may lie about you and discredit you and defame you, and you get hurt. When the persecution comes, do not be overwhelmed by it and overcome by it, so that inside yourself you pant and rage and cry and weep and fume and desire all sorts of bad upon the person. That's being overcome by the evil. Take overcome in the sense you're swept away by it and it consumes you. Be not overcome of evil. The subject in these final verses is persecution and hostility. But overcome evil with good. And by your composed and good reaction, you may, by the grace of God, be instrumental in overcoming that person's hostility. So that's the sense of those words. But I missed out verse 15 because the subject had changed for verse 15, 16 and to some extent verse 17. So just as we come to conclusion, verse 15, the standards for Christian people rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep and that is not only counsel and advice for comforting or helping each other in our different circumstances but it's a a challenge to our hearts why why would I not want to be happy with somebody who had some great cause of happiness Why would I not want to lead them in praising God for that or join with them in their happiness? This is the question. Why would I not want to rejoice with my fellow believer who has cause to rejoice? Is it because I'm jealous or envious? Is it because I'm loveless? I have no regard for him or for her. Why should I care if he's advantaged in some way or benefited in some way or lifted up in some way? It's not nothing to me. Well, it's a good way of examining ourselves. Examining ourselves shows me what a loveless, heartless, cold, indifferent individual I am if I can't rejoice with them that rejoice. So it helps me to test myself. 
No, says the apostle, rejoice with them that do rejoice and share them with them in thanksgiving to God. And then weep with them that weep. Well, let's ask the same question to examine ourselves. Why am I not moved with the person who is in grief? For a good cause, for a good reason. Things have happened that are bound to cause grief. Why can I not sow with them? Because I've grown so selfish and self-interested and loveless and cold. Oh, I need to fall on my knees before the Lord and repent of that and ask for the new nature to be stirred once again within me. So it's not only counsel for conducting ourselves toward one another, but it helps us to search our hearts, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Verse 16, be of the same mind, one towards another. Agree with each other as much as you possibly can. You can't agree with each other on everything, And there are perfectly legitimate differences in tastes and differences in views on many things. We're Christian people, we're not peas in a pod, all commanded to be exactly the same. And uh, our different views and feelings and tastes reflect our different strengths and weaknesses and gifts. But in all the important things, the things of the faith, and our objectives and our aims for the Lord, we try to be of the same mind, one toward another. There are some people who love to be different for the sake of it. Says the Apostle, be of the same mind. Harmonize. Agree as much as you possibly can. Learn from each other. Share objectives. Do not be opinionated. It's it's pride that makes us sometimes so opinionated we almost automatically have to disagree with people on everything. And then these words in verse 16, this is almost too much for us in one morning, but these words, mind not high things, or perhaps mind not high people. The things in the Greek could refer to things, careers, situations, or it could refer to people. And it's very possible it refers to people because the second part of the sentence reads, but condescend to men of low estate. So naturally the sentence would read, mind not high people. This is a big temptation for some. There are some people, almost every time you talk to them, They're anxious that you should know that their doctor is the highest doctor in the world. Or their school is the best and the highest with the highest this and the highest that. But some people almost automatically go to assessing everything in terms of how noble, how high, how accomplished this person or that person is. Or we have someone in our church who is up there. And uh, no, don't fix your interests and your respect and your affection or your desires on high people. That's a great temptation. And I've seen people go off the track, Christian people on this count. And they've wanted to so if God lifts you up in the world and trusts you with high station and wealth to disperse and so on, Well, that's God who does it for you. But don't aspire to it yourself. My great aim is to be the highest and the biggest and the best. Mind not high things. Don't fix your thoughts on accomplished people. Accomplished people, famous people, high people are, according to the scriptures, but I've not time to go to details this morning, are very seldom wise. And they're very seldom moral. 
and they're very seldom spiritual. So mind not high things. And if Satan thinks that here's a chink in your armour and that you have a taste for admiring or aspiring to high things, he'll exploit that. And before long, you'll be putting all your energies and all your desires into your bigger and better home, your bigger and better appointment, your bigger and better everything, and you'll have no time to serve the Lord. Very little time to him, and your admiration for the great and the good will take away most of your spiritual ardour and tastes. And that's very sad. So the Apostle says, mind not high things. And finally, I must come to conclusion, but condescend to men of low estate. I don't think that word condescend is a very good one. Condescend to men of low estate. I'll tell you what the word condescend does to us. It may not have done it in the the time of the King James translators, but the word, the sense it carries now, is that if I condescend to someone of low estate, it leaves me higher than him. Condescend. It's something that descends. No, the translation is not ideal for the present day here. It's not condescend to men of low estate but it's associate with men of low estate that's literally the Greek is if you're interested it means uh, carry with men of low estate but the sense is associate partner with be on the same footing as don't condescend I am somehow the higher or the richer or the better educated or the better. Don't condescend, be very charitable and mix with people lower than yourself. That puts a wrong taste, a wrong flavour into the translation today. It's carry with, associate with, work with, partner with. There's no difference between you because you may have been fortunate. You may have had the better education by far. You may have fallen on your feet and got the good job and had the money and had the office and the station and so on. But in the Christian family, viewed spiritually, God makes no difference between you. Spiritually, you're exactly the same. Spiritually, there's a distribution of gifts. The person supposedly of low estate, the humble person, may actually have a larger share of spiritual gifts and capabilities, may be wiser, may be shrewder, may have all manner of things that you don't have. We don't look at things like the worldling does. Condescend, no, carry with, walk with, associate with, humbly. That's your brother, your equals before the Lord, that's your sister in the Lord associate with, work with lowly people. And by that you will be greatly enriched. You may be sure of it. That's surely enough for us today. Just a practical look at some of the standards of Christian character and Christian behaviour. May the Lord help us.